I'm just gonna blast off and I'm gonna get right into it, I think. Because there's uh I'm down ten pounds on my cut unk app showing for the first time. Hey, that's awesome. Uh congratulations, chatter. I am also doing pretty well on my cut as well. For Alexa 5 a.m. No, I didn't wake him up. I, I I we went to the we went to the gym at like a reasonable hour. March was there as well. I had a I had a conversation with uh Twitch. We have a one off like if it bangs, we might do more of this. We have a very cool show that we got lined up for you guys. I'm not going to like, I'm going to tease it a little bit, uh, but uh, we are working on, we are working on doing a show that I think will be sick. And I think that uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's, it's going to be, uh, you know, very serious, very serious debate style show, but maybe not so serious at the same time. It may be very funny. And we're going to be doing that as a fundraiser as well. So, um, Get excited for that. But uh, that was what I was talking about. Did you see Mr. V's presidential run candidacy take? I did. Oh, my God. I keep forgetting to fucking talk about that. You know what? I'm going to put that in my title as well. And I'm also going to talk about uh, all of the people that are uh, saying Biden should drop out. That's, the, that's today's show once again, for the most part. The first half of the show will be occupied a lot by that kind of thing. Um, anyway, run for president. Mr. Bish says he wants to run for president. Joe Biden. Uh, will the Dems go with Joe Pelosi and Clooney come out with additional ear throat hurt? No. Statements. RNC is coming up. So we'll talk about publican policies and why they're trying to moderate. Felix Biederman, along with the Aussie boys, will be on stream. Okay. Shot TV slash Hassan Abbey. Um, dude, Sheltered Rosebud. Are we going to cover Gaza today? Okay, take a week off. Sheltered Rosebud is very close to the perma. Very close. Like, just nearing the perma. Okay, along with the Aussie boys, will be on stream. Okay, wants to run for president. The Chevron decision got overturned recently, though. I don't know if that's important enough to cover. What do you mean? That's like incredibly important story. Anyway, is Alexa off camera waiting to be led on stream? No, they're just like doing stuff. They're they're working on some shit currently. Um, bro, Chinese shit posting on Biden Trump. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you, Thamacy's, for the playlist. Mm -hmm. Doo, 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 doo. All right, let's do it. Let's blast off. SCOTUS remove the six year statute of limitations for regulations. Is Jover? Yeah, it's it is Jover. It's fucking Jover. We are bouldering towards uh, a a even worse dystopia. Uh, I almost texted a number on your hand without reading it first. I'm dyslexic as fuck. What? Uh, anyway, here's the blast off. Mr. Beast wants to run for president. Will the Dems go with Joe Pelosi, including come out with additional statements? RNC's coming up, so we'll talk about Republican policies and why they're trying to moderate. Biological on with Aussie boys on stream, twitch.tv slash Hassan Abi. Yes, I saw the AOC file for articles of impeachment, which is a bold and brave and good move overall. What is this? Did you see Uba call you out? Cheers for streaming the film. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why he had blocked me before, but he's like really good friends with Alex. And apparently, you know, uh Alex had told him about me as well so i don't know why it might have been like a blue check mark blocker but we got on band let's go grown ass man named uba the fuck going on in the uk bro yo you're not you're not even joking about that that is like that is real valid that's a valid claim dude i don't even understand also uba can't be blocking me uh especially because like he looks so much like boris johnson who is also turkish so maybe Uba is also Turkish. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't know that. Not getting your Twitch notifications more. Not sure if it's just me or anyone else. Uh, no, it's probably, it, it happens every now and then. You know what I mean? There's not really much we can do about it. Uh, this is why people block you. Why? Because I said he's like Boris Johnson, a Turkish man, potentially. It's just random. Sometimes Twitch does that shit. You don't have to, you can't worry about that. Now that nobody can see my likes, I'm going to like all your blast offs every day from now on. Hell yeah.
I get your notifications, but I want to turn them off. Just not fucking with you like that anymore. Any tips on disabling them? <laughs> Good one. Um, yeah, Twitch don't send noties when you're late. Twitch doesn't send noties when you're like even a little bit off of like your exact uh, going live time. It's weird. But I think it's because like they have a algorithm. Like they have a math calculation internally of like so many channels that they serve people because like everyone follows like a shit ton of people right and if they're going live at the same time like there's only a finite amount of notifications they want to serve you they don't like usually they don't usually serve every single person a push notification so if i'm not like immediately live at 11 as i am every day i think it like changes how many people get served the push notifications they have smart notifications if you don't actually go click on the go live button every single time then uh you know they might not they might not necessarily uh, serve it to you any longer. It's stuff like that. Um, literally just watch Esmond go react to someone calling the Mr. B sweet nine-year-old level thought. Bro, literally said, why are people shitting on him for trying to unite people? How is he so oblivious to the fact that he also has a nine-year-old brain? Listen, dude, you have to understand. Most Americans literally look at politics like it's a fucking, like, like it's a kid's story, Okay. Yeah, Mr. Beast being like, I'm going to talk to the far right and the far left. And it's just like, okay, so what? We're just killing like, we're just only going to kill half the Latino population. <laughs> like, that's just, they don't, most people, most people don't think about it. They don't understand it. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just like America is designed for people to be this fucking stupid when it comes to politics. Okay. It's great. It keeps everybody sedated. Anyway. Such a fucking insane thing to say when we know how uh, we know how show crowd crazy people are with Ava. It's a twelve years view, twelve year olds view of politics. Anyway, bro would be like, "What if we met in the middle of the Holocaust and no Holocaust?" Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like some things you don't, you know, you you can't hear the crow. Thank you for the five two one. Give the subs. You can't really have a like a middle of the ground approach, you know. Um, but yeah, this is the real debate. Uh, I don't know why China got to see the real debate. We got to see the fake debate. That was AI debate. This is what actually happened. Your opinion on the everlasting CCP bullying and flexing on other countries in the China Sea? Hey, bro, you called it the China Sea. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my take on it. Listen, if every other country, if every other major power, including Russia, including the United States, including Israel, operated like the CCP operated, okay, we would literally, I'm sorry, objectively, like, yeah, sometimes they do some fuck shit, whatever, okay? But if they all dialed it back to the same degree as fucking Xi Jinping, we would have no war. Like, what are we talking about? We would have long lasting, resilient peace. It's so funny when people are like, yeah, dude, I can't believe the uh, <laughs> delusional Andy. Yeah. Okay, dude. Yeah, I know. I am so unimaginably upset at like, uh, China overtaking like filipino boats or something while i'm literally covering an ongoing ethnic cleansing campaign with american dollars every day it is laughable okay like yesterday two days ago russia blew up a child's hospital in ukraine what the fuck are we talking about okay now you can make the argument that like well china is helping them out and there's some validity to that you know, you can, you can make that argument at least, but it's like, once again, if every other fucking major power behaved in the really aggressive and violent ways that China behaved, there would be no fucking war. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> like a child's hospital? Yes. A child's hospital, a hospital run by a child, a singular child. Yeah. Anyway, you can't, you can't say China is a peaceful nation nowadays because everyone is too woke. <laughs> like. Do you guys understand what I mean? Like, uh, this is this doesn't mean that like China doesn't do shit, right? Like, of course they do. They they're a major power, and every major power does some shit every now and then, both internally and also externally. But like, if we genuinely dialed it back, okay, to a degree where the greatest offense is that like, um, I don't know, uh, America 
in its own fucking backyard, in its own uh, territory, not extending to fucking Guam, by the way. I'm talking like, uh, or, or not even in between like Hawaii and mainland US. I'm talking like fucking off the coast of Miami is, is uh, behaving in a territorial manner. And that's the most violent thing that America does. We'd be like, America's the greatest nation on earth. What the fuck are you talking about? I would be fucking saying that. Not Guam erasure. The existence of Guam in and of itself automatically fucking calls into question the, the different standards that we have for the United States of America as opposed to our foreign adversaries. <laughs> like, anyway. Hassan is right. China should own the South China Sea. Fuck those Southeast Asian countries. Brother, that is not even remotely what I'm saying at all. Okay. People just have one note on this issue, and it's so funny. You literally brought up, what do you think about this? And it's like, I don't know, man. I feel like, I feel like things that we take for granted that America does times a thousand, okay? Like, it doesn't even meet my radar when we're talking about Russia blowing up a fucking children's hospital just last, uh, you know, just two days ago. And we're talking about an ongoing ethnic cleansing being done with American taxpayer dollars. Like, it is ridiculous to be like, yeah, dude, that thing... That thing right there, that's actually, that's really frustrating to me. We need to, it's like, it's like me covering a fucking, uh, it's like me covering a, I'm Malaysian, by the way. Oh, then enjoy your fucking high-speed rail. What are you talking about? Gee, get out of here. Anyway, the only Malaysian that is in the chat being like, honestly, honestly, I don't know about this. <laughs> you relapsed on responding to chatters. Yeah, I know. Um. China has the Belt Road Initiative. Bad take us on, just being honest. Yeah, I know. That is so bad. Once again, uh, IMF World Bank in comparison to the Belt and Road Initiative is so much worse that Foreign Policy Magazine is not even on board with what you are saying. You are getting your talking points from Reddit, which is seemingly more to the right of Foreign Policy Magazine. Like... At that point, it's just like, who am I having a conversation with? Like, you're upset that they have better loan conditions that they're offering to African partners, trade partners, than the Western world has ever even considered offering. And it is so apparent that even, like, institutional foreign policy uh, apparatus media members are recognizing that and going we have to change our attitude towards the way we deal with african countries because china is cleaning it <sighs> anyway reddit is just every state department having conversations with each other through news headlines and just think tanks generated i just don't even understand it like um <laughs> like all right the China debt, uh, debt trap myth was created by the Trump administration. I don't think it was created by the Trump administration. Yeah, cleaning it like the West cleaned it in the, 19, uh, the 1700s. Yeah, dude. Um, <laughs> yes. China's, China's unconditional loans, which they fucking routinely actually uh, pee-pee-poof, are, are uh, identical to what the Western world did to Africa in the 1700s. Yeah. Because, yeah, we are talking about China. You can come in if you no, want. What? I do. It's in the um, it's in the cupboards on the leftmost side on the kitchen. Um, yeah, leftmost side, third cupboard or second cupboard. Yeah, drawer. Anyway, <laughs> I am accusing China of doing if they did since forever is cute. I am the most moral bank. IDF the most moral military. I am the most moral bank. Anyway, once again, uh, ultimately China is not fucking perfect. No nation is. There's plenty of issues. They also make conditional allegiances with like ridiculous fucking paramilitary groups or whoever the fuck uh, is is immediately beneficial for them. Um, look no further than uh, even when you look at like Burma, Myanmar. Um, they will sometimes be anti-government and other times be pro-military junta. It's just uh, entirely dependent on where the fuck they are uh that week if there's like uh as we read about on this broadcast when they have a real issue with people fucking when they have a real issue with like chinese citizens being kidnapped to go uh work in these like um uh, what is it pig butchering places like to do online cyber scams and shit then they're like oh yeah we're just gonna uh we're just gonna give the money to whichever side deals with this problem better so it is what it is <sighs> But um, 
ultimately uh american exceptionalism chat turns into joe biden when it comes to china and foreign policy i know it's just like you've been watching vice huh no if we literally uh read an article on it a couple articles uh, on that on the stream i'll never understand the china glaze i need a lesson yeah okay we're just i don't know why the fuck we dove into china so fast when we're talking about the United States of America. Oh, it's because Biden is talking to NATO and like um, the Western chauvinists are geared up. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> this is like, this is the, this is the power hour. This is a Western chauvinism power hour uh, right now. We got all the war perverts in the chat. That's right. That's right, baby. NATO, 75 year anniversary of NATO. Let's go. Um, anyway, yeah, our dicks are hard and big and large. Not like the Chinese dick. Okay, they're fucking, they're not doing it. They're, they're too violent, but they're also simultaneously not powerful. Our dicks are hard for NATO. Okay, China is doing microaggressions, condemn them. Yeah. The CCP has aura, that's why we glaze China. It's true. It does. Xi Jinping has aura, for sure. Um, many social credits for me, hopefully. Biden older than NATO and Israel. <laughs> Biden older than a lot of things. Do you understand? A lot. Um... But if you call that out, you're being ageist. Let's start there. Here is Representative Stephen Horsford. More than 70% of voters think that President Biden uh, is not demonstrating the, the capacity to be president. 56% uh, of Democrats say that they would be better off with another nominee. Those are the concerns that I'm talking about that are showing up in the numbers and that are affecting his approval rating. What I find interesting is that the issue is more around ageism and ableism and not what this president, President Biden, has done. More than 70 percent. That's right, baby. Y'all are being ableist. Y'all are being aged. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. OK, what an insane dude. We are. Oh, my God. The Democratic Party is so fucking cooked. It's actually crazy. It's actually crazy. <sighs> Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hassan Avi Chatter. Yeah, that's like that's like when uh <laughs> he's he's chirping at me from the TV. He's on CNN, but he's actually a Hassan Avi Chatter at heart. You can tell. The Democratic strat the Democrat strategy is calling their own voters ableist. Yeah. Because they're gonna hear that and they're gonna go, Oh my god, I've done a microaggression, I've done a no growth, I need to fix this right now. Okay, the like saying Biden should drop out because he's too old, claiming that that is ages is like saying your grandmother who's now blind uh, because of her cataracts should not drive. Like it is ableist in the same way that that's ableist, which is to say it's not ableist. Okay, it is ridiculous to claim that that is ableist. You need cognitive functioning to run the most powerful position on the planet. I don't think this is a controversial take. If you consider this to be a controversial take, you are a psychopath. Anyway, we're going to talk about Nancy Pelosi in a second. But before we do that, Brandon spoke to NATO leaders as Democrats are holding closed door meetings over his candidacy. It's a big deal for Brandon. He's like, he's going full blown. He's, he's going full tilt. I'm the NATO guy. Don't think that is a solid way to win an election. Okay. I don't think you can run around and be like, I'm the NATO guy, Jack. Michigan, I'm the NATO guy, Wisconsin, I'm the NATO guy, I made NATO, vote for me. Literally, perhaps one of the worst possible ways to run for president. Like, nobody gives a shit. Americans, historically, as we have talked about, don't give a fuck about foreign policy, which has been a very beneficial position for our robust defense contracts our robust defense industry. It's great. It's great for them. Nobody gives a fuck, so we get to do whatever the fuck we want. People don't even comprehend that, like, all the money that's going to those initiatives is actually money that could be going to, I don't know, fixing our fucking roads, beefing up our infrastructure for climate change, you know, uh, paying for health care, all these different things. Of course, we're not going to do that. The average American doesn't think about that, but because the average American also doesn't think about that, you can't run on that. That's not a thing that you can run on. You can't be like, I'm the fucking foreign policy president. Anyway, 
Biden spent the day at the NATO summit in Washington as many Democrats on Capitol Hill were struggling with his decision to stay in the presidential race. Nancy Cordes is at the White House. Nancy, good morning. Good morning, Nate. President Biden is set to meet with union leaders this morning. He spoke to Democratic mayors last night as he works to reassure worried re Democrats. But every time the White House thinks things are calming down, a new challenge pops up. Today, NATO is more powerful than ever. Just as President Biden was looking to project strength with a speech to NATO leaders yesterday, House and Senate Democrats were holding tense closed door meetings. We are riding with Biden. We are riding with Biden. Was that the are you all on the same page? No. <laughs> I love how fucking old everyone is. Like on both sides of this conversation, even people who are like, People who are like, yeah, Biden is too old to run. They're old as dirt. People who are like, nah, Biden is great, actually. His age is perfectly fine. Old as dirt. It is just like, God, this is such a fucking geronto This is such a gerontocracy. Oh, my God. We are getting to a point where it's just like, we are getting to a point where it's just 75 plus year olds voting. And they're voting for 75 plus year olds. Okay, that's it. If you're over the age of 75, you run for office or you vote for someone who's running for office, and that's it. We're <laughs> no one else. It's not it's not important for you. It's not it doesn't matter. We don't give a fuck about what you have to say if you are under the age of 75. Okay? If you're 74, suck my dick, young buck. You ain't got a say in this conversation. You better see yourself out, okay? You better see yourself out of this equation. Get the fuck out of here. They have basically become fossils. What do you mean you're not on the same page? They're not even in the same book. They were discussing Biden's candidacy and polling that shows him slipping in battleground states. They're worried that a poor turnout for him could hurt them too. Last night, Colorado's Michael Bennett became the first Democratic senator to publicly say Biden can't beat Trump. Donald Trump is on track, I think, to win this election uh, and maybe win it by a landslide and take with him the Senate and the House. New Jersey Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill urged Biden to help lead the process toward a new nominee. Did you give him a heads up? Did they? I did. Did they try and stop you? Um, they did. But New York's Jerry Nadler, who told colleagues privately on Sunday that Biden should leave the race, now says he backs Biden. The president made very clear. That's the funniest part that they just like, they just keep also swapping positions because like Nadler was like, ah, I don't know, maybe the president's fine. Ah, I don't know. It's like, like he was one of the first elder statesmen who, uh, who is also elderly uh, to, to come out and be like, yeah, this can't happen. Okay. And then now he's turning around and he's like, I don't know. <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's it's just what the fuck are we doing? What are we doing? Yes, Tim Kane in the membrane, Tim Kane in the brain, baby. Senator Tim Kane to Joe Khalil TV. I have complete confidence that Joe Biden will do the patriotic thing for the country and he's going to make that decision. He never he's never disappointed me. Tim Kaine, dude. Tim fucking Kaine. Bro, Democrats are talking. Okay, let me tell you something, okay? Democrats are talking about New York being a battleground state. I have never seen such panic in the Democratic Party. Like, Bernie Sanders potentially becoming the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party is literally not as scary for these motherfuckers. And that's the scariest thing for these motherfuckers okay like they are they're saying new york is a battleground state that is not even correct okay that's like even i would look at that and go okay you're being a little fucking ridiculous right now unless you are seeing something that i am not seeing okay that is insane that is just like an absolutely insane fucking take yeah they're like massachusetts is gone they're making a second Republican Party out there, okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> Massachusetts has fallen. Vermont. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, all this stuff. Uh, ben Shapiro also testified in Congress, which is pretty funny. Um, we'll, we'll do that as well.
their internal polling must be dire. Yeah, it's just it is I think they're I think they're a little bit hysterical, I'll be honest, but like this is them trying to, you know, crease the heat a little bit, slowly but surely turning the fucking dial, okay? Doing their very best to be like, Brandon, get the fuck out without actually saying, Brandon, get the fuck out. What are you doing? You're old as dirt. Some of them have now started saying, Brandon, get the fuck out. You're old as dirt. Okay. But you have to understand a fundamental truth here that I have brought forward multiple times. If you're like, why aren't the Democrats saying this loudly and proudly? Why aren't the Democrats actually coming out of the gates swinging at Brandon? Because the one legitimate advantage that the democratic party has over the republican party for all of the moderate votes that they want to get for all the independents that they want to get okay is that they are a competent party they are not a chaotic party as opposed to the republican party that is both chaotic and incompetent and crazy and also very far right democrats are supposed to show stability so they can't fucking come out and be like, we are in a state of massive panic here. They're trying to fucking do this as politely as possible. They just keep going, come on, come on, come on. Do the right thing. We love you. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. We love you. You're great. Do the right thing. Okay? Because if Brandon keeps this shit up and he's just like, nah, I'm not getting out. <laughs> I'm not getting out. You shut your mouth. I'm doing the best. I'm God King. Lord Almighty can't get me to take a, take myself out of this race. Like the more the the more Brandon refuses to hear what the Democrats are saying in the most polite terms as possible, the more the Democrats have to fucking increase the pressure, turn up the heat a little bit, and the more they turn up the heat, the more this looks chaotic, okay? And the more the Democrats look chaotic, the more the Democrats look chaotic, the more they look like Republicans, okay? They are losing every, like they're losing all of their advantage, which is crazy. They're losing the, the what remains of the advantages. It's like basically throwing abortion in the trash or something. Like that's the one final thing they have. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to do a fucking January 6th on top of that, too? You're just going to be perfectly Republican at this point? Brandon, in the last quarter, has decided to throw so goddamn hard and just turn into this, like, even older Donald Trump figure. Incredibly narcissistic, incredibly cynical, incredibly right-wing on a lot of issues. Like, Brandon is going to throw so hard by just coming out and being like, honestly, guys, abortion is murder. <laughs> Listen, Jack! Abortion is murder, and I don't think we should have it. <laughs> I'm proposing to throw women in jail if they try to get an abortion. I'll tell you what. <laughs> it's just crazy. They're killing babies, Jack. Immigrants are doing rape, and then they're killing babies. <laughs> watch me. Not under my watch. I'll put an end to that. Yes, say that he's running. And for me, that's dispositive. We have to support him. He's not the only lawmaker who sounds more resigned. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't that his position 10 years ago. Listen, a lot can change over 10 years. Like at the top of the hour, there used to be a one minute ad break. Now there's a three minute ad break at the top of the hour. But the reality is, the unchanging reality is that America is a shining beacon of democracy and a $5 a month subscription will allow you to no longer see those ads at the top of the hour. Folks, if you are lucky enough to get gifted a sub, you will also no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. But if you're not lucky and you make your own luck, you can do that by subscribing for free with a Twitch Prime. Why, 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 why? Here's the three minute ad break now, Jack. Okay. A uh, King Henry the Fourth. Thank you for the ten gifted. J M W Cincy. Thank you for the five gifted subs. <laughs> Trump wants to deport all immigrants. I'll go further and deport American citizens. Joe Biden before the election, probably. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm instituting a new test. If you even remotely look Latino, I will deport you. <laughs> no more. Even if you got Spanish background, I'm deporting all the Puerto Ricans back to their island. Italians too. 
Um, Richie Torres had this to say, I, in determining how to proceed as a party, there must be a serious reckoning with how down ballot affect of whoever we nominate. What matters is not how we feel, but what the numbers tell us. An unsentimental analysis of cold, hard numbers, which is no personal feelings or political loyalty should inform what we decide and whom we nominate. If we're going to choose a particular path, we should be clear-eyed about the consequences. Blindness is not bliss. Come the terrifying threat of a Trump presidency. That's crazy. He's losing. He's losing Israel's strongest. He's losing Israel's strongest representative. Okay. Um, this is funny. Everyone under 50. Joe has dementia. It's obvious. Everyone closer to Joe's age. I don't know. Maybe the sun was just in his eyes. I will never die. <laughs> exactly. Um, new Hakeem Jeffries told House Dems in a meeting in meetings this week, including today, that he's going to relay the concerns he's hearing to Biden. Two sources tell Manu Raju. Um, uh, and Jeffries backs Biden and has been in listening mode, but this is the latest sign that Dem panic isn't going away. My favorite part about this past, my favorite part about this like past week has been, and I'm going to get to it in a second when we talk about Nancy Pelosi. Okay. My favorite part about this past week has been the new method that Democrats have decided to apply to the, to the chaos, which is, oh, Joe will make a decision soon. It's like, what do you mean he'll make a decision soon? He has said he's running like 18 times, bro. Fuck yes, you no. mean? Let's talk about Nancy Pelosi. I'm going to skip it. I'm going to get to this. Because Nancy Pelosi was on Morning Joe, which has an audience of one. Okay? This is specifically for one guy okay it is identical to donald trump in that regard obviously um the fox and friends or was it fox five no his fox and friends of the morning was for donald trump he loved that show he watched it all day every day he called into it morning joe is joe biden's fox and friends okay and so nancy pelosi's like hey let me publicly go on here and just, you know, reiterate some concerns. Okay? And, and she did. She sure did. Let's take a look. Speaker Emerita, Democratic Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi of California and the leader of the Democratic opposition of Belarus, Svetlana Sikhanaskaya. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Of course, Svetlana fled Belarus in 2020 after running against authoritarian leader Alexander Lukashenko in the presidential election and is widely thought to have won, despite Lukashenko declaring victory amid widespread reports of the election being rigged in his favor. Sound familiar? Fetlana and former Speaker Pelosi are the co-authors of a new op-ed in the Washington Post entitled, NATO is a Bulwark Against Tyranny. Uh, thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, I, I want to start with you on uh, President Biden first, um, because over... What was the makeup person on strike? Nancy Pelosi looks ridiculous. I actually disagree. I saw this. I saw pieces of this interview uh, earlier this morning, and I actually thought she looks kind of nice. Like, this is completely irrelevant to the main point of contention here, but I think Nancy Pelosi here, without, like, the crazy old person makeup that she normally does, legitimately looks kind of good. Like, I think this is a good, uh, this is a, a, a much, are you drunk? No, I think she, I think she looks a lot better with, uh, you know, subtle makeup rather than the the classic old person cake that she puts on normally good in a grandma wait guys not everything has to mean that i want to fuck her what are you talking about like i'm not saying i want to have sex with nancy pelosi here you fucking freaks i'm just saying that like there's a type of makeup that old people do where you're just like kind of sad when you see it you're like oh that's not the best like I can kind of smell it when I see it. You know what I mean? Like your grandma's uh, cologne or perfume, basically. That's what it looks like. It's just a very, just in your face. She didn't do that today. She had a much more reserved, like much, you know, a, a, a much more, um, how do I describe it? I don't even know what the proper term for it is because I don't ever talk about makeup, but I, I, it's, it's a more natural look and I think it's good. It's better. For the past 24 hours behind the scenes, there's been a lot of, um, depression among Democrats, the phone lines 
burning up, uh, concerned about his candidacy and whether or not he can win. And some even out loud are shaky at best about President Biden, whether or not he should step out of the race. Um, the headlines, the polling, it all feels very dark. How do you think the president is doing in light of his poor debate performance? Can he do more? And what do you say to Dem Democrats in Congress and even members of the Senate who are beginning to waver in their support? She looks exhumed, Lamau. Bro, what are you talking about? She's literally the crib creeper. She's old as fuck. That's just how she looks. I'm simply stating that she looks better with this level of makeup than she does with the normal level of makeup that she puts on. Okay? She's not beating it as hard, and I think it looks better in comparison, okay? Sometimes chat thinks I'm comparing her to fucking Dua Lipa or something. You guys do not understand that, like, when I analyze something, oftentimes I'm analyzing it, and I clearly will tell you, I'm analyzing it with, like, very clear-cut fucking boundaries, okay? She's still a corpse. There's nothing you can do about that. She's just old. That's just the passage of time. That's just a thing that happens, okay? Good morning, Mika. I, I, that's one version of the story. Uh, what I do want to say is that yesterday I was honored to be present at the president's speech for Na at NATO. He was absolutely spectacular. He was received over and over again uh, with uh, ovations for what he had to say and the force with which he said it. And then he gave the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, to Jen Stoltenberg. The Dude, one thing I need you guys to pay attention to right now, one thing I need you to pay attention to is that time, time somebody talks about Biden or specifically to Biden, okay? Because that's what Nancy's doing here. They always talk like they're talking about like a child <laughs> or I don't know, a dog that is, you know, going to die soon. And everyone is just like, there's this, there's this energy in the air where everyone's like, yeah, you know, he's doing his, he's doing his very best. He's such a good boy. He's such a good boy. Isn't he such a good boy? He's doing the NATO thing. It's a big week for him. Okay. He's so brave. He's doing his goodest, his darndest. And it's crazy. It's like, bro, that's the president, okay? That's the president. We're not, we're not hyping up a, a, a five-year-old for coloring inside the lines here. What do you mean? He's having a big week, okay? It's NATO's 75th year anniversary. It's a big week for Brandon. Secretary General of NATO, I felt very honored by that because as one who has received it, Jen's getting it brought luster uh, to that honor. So it was a, uh, a beautifully received, energetic presentation by the president. Politics is politics. People have their interest in terms of their own region and the rest. And so we are the Democratic Party, a party that is, uh, shall we say, uh, not lockstep. Uh, but this president has been a great president. And I can tell you firsthand, as a person who orchestrated many of the pieces of legislation that the president takes great pride in, and he should, because he was there at the table, chapter and verse, very conversant with a vision, a purpose. That's crazy. He was able to speak. The president, folks, isn't he the best? He was capable of speech. Okay, that's right. He was holding his own like the goodest boy. He was holding his own. Now, obviously, this isn't the main point, okay? The main point is coming, and you'll see when it comes. Uh, but she's doing the classic, the classic Democrat that's, like, trying to fucking tell Biden to step down move, where they just, like, spend the first 10 minutes talking about how great he is. Okay, talking about how wonderful of a job he's doing. He carries himself with so much charisma and pizzazz. Okay, and it's, yeah, open face shit sandwich. Yeah, no, literally, it's just like, it's a compliment sandwich. Okay, just understand, he is doing, he is deserving of all of the vanilla ice cream in the White House tonight. Okay, he's a good boy.
purpose, with the knowledge of the issues, with values underlining it all, and again, always asking the question, what does this mean to working families in our country? Uh, so uh, any thought that uh, he, he wasn't able to deliver on all of those is, I can just say, just didn't happen. So, Madam Speaker, you just went through the president's record, but let me ask you about the current moment. Does he have your support to be the head of the Democratic ticket? As long as the president has the president, it's up to the president to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look, this is the this is the moment. Okay, pay close attention. President's record, but let me ask you about the current moment. Does he have your support to be the head of the Democratic ticket? As long as the president has the president, it's up to the president to decide if he is going to run. Uh, we're all encouraging him uh, to to make that decision. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Make the choice to run. Nancy Pelosi has not been in a fucking vacuum for the past week. She knows. She knows the president has decided. Why is she acting like he hasn't decided? He keeps saying, I'm running, Jack. Fuck you mean? Oh, it's up. It's up to the president to make that decision. He literally said, only God can take me out of this race. And then said, if someone wants to unseat me, they should run against me. Primaries are fucking over. And he's over here being like, run against me, Jack. Why is Nancy Pelosi saying that? Why is Nancy Pelosi saying, oh, the president needs to make a decision. We're just all encouraging him to make the decision. He's made his decision. He's made his decision so many times over, as a matter of fact. So why is Nancy Pelosi still acting like the president has not made this decision? Is it because the Democratic Party apparatus only has one speed and that's just gaslighting? Sure, that's valid. They do love doing that. They do love acting like the things that everyone can see and hear and, and understand and internalize are, are easily avoidable, right? <laughs> you could just be like, oh, yeah, he hasn't decided yet. No, he has. He has said it time and time again, which he is going to address in a second. Let's keep going. Because time is running short. Uh, the, oh. uh, I think, overwhelming support of the, of the caucus, it's not for me to say. I'm not the head of the caucus anymore. But uh, he's beloved. He is respected. And people want him to make that decision. He has, not me. he has said he has made the decision. He has said firmly this week he is going to run. Do you want him to run? I want him to do whatever he decides to do. And that's that's the way it is. Whatever he do What do you mean? Well, OK, so uh, OK, so let's say Nancy Pelosi hadn't heard Biden say he's going to run. Right. Let's say let's say Nancy Pelosi is shocked. OK, at this new information that she just found out okay on motherfucking morning joe what's the reaction why is she why is she not addressing the new information that she just found out about oh the president has made his decision that's weird we we'll want him to make that decision he has not me. he has said he has made the decision he has said firmly this week he is going to run do you want him to run I want him to do whatever he decides to do. And that's that's the way it is. Whatever he decides, we go with. I think it's really important, and I would hope everyone would join in, to let him deal with this NATO conference. This is a very big deal. 30 heads of, over 30 heads of state are here. Uh, he is. All of his friends are here. Let him have his little party. Come on. It's a big week for him. He's a big boy. This is a big week. He's been trying to put this party together. It's a tea party. Okay? Let him have his moment. He's just a little guy. And then he'll make his decision. It's like, he has, though. But he has, though. That's not what this conversation is about. Now, the reason why, the reason why she's answering in the way that she's answering this question, which is a very direct question, obviously, is for, uh, for the, 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 Reasons that I mentioned time and time again over the course of the past week uh, plus now, which is they can't openly say I, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Emeritus, one of the most, you know, influential uh, older members of the Democratic Party who have been a lifelong Democrat and a, and a bulwark of uh, institutionalist uh, Democratic Party uh, defense 
am saying Joe Biden needs to step aside. She can't say that. That's chaotic. So she's trying to communicate to Joseph Robinette Brandon from the television. Hey, dickhead, come on, drop out. Am I having copium to think he mean, this means he will step down after NATO meeting or they will push harder? Well, the closed door caucus meetings are happening and have been happening for, this past, uh, for the past two days now, for the past three days now. And the issue is, it's very, it's, it's very back and forth. But more and more senators and House of Representatives, uh, like representatives of the House, are coming out and saying like, yeah, no, this can't continue. Okay? The host of it, and that means not just hosting, it means orchestrating the discussion and setting the agenda. And he's doing so magnificently. And I've said to everyone... Wouldn't that message be taken better by Joe if she went and talked to him personally rather than doing it on TV? Like, why not just go to the White House and ask him straight up? Um, I, I don't know what the best answer to that question is. It's pure speculation, right? But my speculation is that they have tried to pressure him. He's just not really listening. He's very stubborn. I think that he's being a little bit stubborn. If you notice, like, he didn't even talk. He didn't even talk to, like, uh, he, he did not calm his own party for a week after the debate. Like, he did not talk to anyone except for his close his closest staffer that have been with him for like 40 years, Jill Biden, and even Hunter fucking Biden. And, you know, that was pretty weird. And even then, since then, he's only talked to like a total of 20 Democratic Party members. Okay? So, you know. Situation is not great. What is this? So stupid. It's like when you ask your mom for a toy and pretend she hasn't said no the last four times you asked. It wasn't the answer you wanted, so you'll just ignore it and keep asking. Same strat. Yeah. I think that one House Democrat, a Biden ally, told me they think the White House and campaign will limit the president after this week. I think he'll survive the convention if he just limits himself at this point. This is obviously not what many of the other Dem lawmakers are calling for. Yep. They're hitting the... They're hitting the la la la, I can't hear you button, which is funny because that did carry him across the finish line, or at least that carried him to a victory in the last primary, okay? And I think that they're making a mistake and thinking that this will carry him to the convention, and then after the convention, it's just like everyone is going to have to defend whoever the Democratic Party candidate is. Oh, wonderful stuff overall. Let's continue. Let's let's just hold off. Whatever you're thinking, either tell somebody privately, but you don't have to put that out on the table until we see how we go this week. Uh, but I'm very proud of the president, and I'm very proud to be here with Svetlana. I've been on this show any number of times, but I have to say it is such an honor to be with her, a champion of democracy, a courageous leader in a very dangerous situation. So I'm looking forward to your hearing from Svetlana. Well, let's let's turn to you now. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, tell us, what is you, here at the NATO summit, what is your overall message? Now, what we are waiting from NATO countries now as people who are fighting against dictatorship, against atrocities in our country, uh, against imperial ambitions of Russia, we need unity and decisiveness. Because the uh, task of dictators is to split democratic world and to fight, you know, not to them, not to provide assistance to those nations who are fighting to, to uh, dictatorship. So we need unity and we need decisiveness because very often... Yeah, the rest of this is NATO related. I don't really care about it as much right now. We'll get back to the NATO conversation in a little bit. Okay. Some Democratic lawmakers are strongly backing the president, others voicing serious concerns as the president hosts the NATO summit in Washington, where his performance is going to be closely watched. Our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, is tracking it all on Capitol Hill. Good morning, Rachel. George, this morning, President Biden will be on the world stage trying to prove to his party that he has what it takes to stay in the race. It comes as some Democrats warn that if he remains on the ticket, Democrats will lose in November. 
This morning, with President Biden determined to stay in the race, Democrats facing a choice whether to stick with Biden or call on him to drop out. But now a seventh House Democrat, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill of New Jersey, calling on Biden to withdraw. I thought I needed to as strongly as possible for new leadership so we could really prosecute the case against Donald Trump. And overnight, Senator Michael Bennett delivering this blunt warning. Donald Trump is on track, I think, to win this election and maybe win it by a landslide and take with him the Senate and the House. Sources tell ABC News Senators John Tester and Sherrod Brown. Yeah, I mean, here's uh, Doggett, the first Dem that actually called for Biden to drop. Uh, said that Pelosi is keeping the situation very open, very fluid. The fact that she's raising these issues, leaving it out there, indicates, I think, her realization that we can't go forward without some greater certainty on a number of aspects of the president's future. Yeah. Nancy Pelosi could be like, no, nah, it's a done deal. She could hit the AOC line, right? Nancy Pelosi could turn around and say th exactly what AOC said and be like, Biden is the candidate. It's a done deal. Shut the fuck up. Let's move on. But she's not doing that. She keeps saying, oh, Biden's going to make a decision. Biden's going to make a decision. I don't think I'm being um, like, uh, I don't think I'm uh, holding out hope. Okay. I don't think I'm holding out hope and like huffing on copium when, uh, when I see, when I see the, the insanity happening in front of our eyes, uh, in front of our eyes unfolding as we speak. Okay. AOC is five head by being so pro Biden that the establishment becomes anti Biden. No, the, the, the squad and their unconditional loyalty to Biden is completely irrelevant in this conversation because they know that they have no fucking momentum internally when it comes to internal party dynamics. They are literally, they're nothing. If anything, it might even prove uh, to be a, a negatively polarizing force that causes the, the, some of the holdouts to actually circle around Biden. Let me fail. You actually might be right, but you got to admit it's cringy to defend Biden. No, it absolutely is. Of course it is. But this is not a conversation that the progressives can have any statements on that will yield a productive result. Okay. That's why I kept saying over and over again, reiterating over and over again, that this is, this is specifically for the establishment Democrats to uh, decide on. Jill Biden might kill off Democrats who are saying Joe should step down since the Supreme Court okayed it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Also raised doubts about the president winning re-election when Democrats met behind closed doors. Do you still support President Biden? I said Ohioans have legitimate questions about what President Biden is going to do. That's not a yes. House Democrats met for hours too. Sources calling that meeting rough. Are you all on the same page? No. What do you mean you're not on the same page? They're not even in the same book. When all of it was over, Democratic leadership from both the House and Senate saying this. Right now. By the way, Biden's uh, team strategy is to keep dripping appearances to delay calls to drop out. He has, a, he has a Thursday meeting, a big boy meeting, as John Kirby said. He has a Thursday press conference at night. Okay, so remember that. And now he's announced that he's going to do a Lester Holt Monday night uh, conversation. Primetime special. 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, sorry, uh, the primetime special is uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern. So, so they're doing this because they're running out the clock. Not until November. Remember, this is something I already mentioned. They're running out the clock. Not until November. They're running out the shot clock until the convention. This is unimaginably selfish. Okay? Unimaginably selfish. Hold on. I'm going to quote tweet this. But until the convention, such a robust democracy in America, Lamau, I know it's, it's great. Why, why the convention do normies even care about that? It's not about the normies. It's about the Democrats. It's not about the normies. It's not about the voters. I, I don't think you understand. This is not about the voters at all. This conversation is being had internally within the democratic party. If he makes it to the convention, it's over. Like there's no going back from that. He knows that obviously no Democrat is going to fucking uh, come out and be like, that's the presidential candidate, but I can't in good conscience vote for him. No, of course. Of course, they're going to unite. And they're going to, whether they want to or not, shut the fuck up and go with Joe.
That is literally what is going on here. They will, the Democrats will absolutely fall in line if he makes it to the convention. And he knows that, and that's precisely why, or his team knows that, and that's precisely why they're trying to run out the clock, not until November, but until the convention, so the Dems unite behind the ticket when it's impossible to swap him. Could they backstab him at the convention? Yes, but that's very unlikely. I think this conversation needs to be had, like I said, in order for this to be, in order for this to be um, a swift transition that doesn't harm whoever comes next, or Brandon himself, really, uh, and his electoral chances, his election chances, they have to do this quickly. They have to do this efficiently. They have to do this with grace. And Biden's senility and Biden's cynicism and Biden's stubborn pride and his, his spite-motivated attitude is causing this to not happen. Which is wild. Seems like they're trying to run out the clock, not until November, but until the conventions of the Dems unite behind the ticket when it's impossible to swap them out. Old move from a spiteful, refuses to listen to reason. Won't get the dire to listen to reason or read the polls. Does it seem like they are doing it though? There seems to be too many pro Biden people, and holdouts have any convincing move on him. No, the holdouts. Uh, I believe you, but what do you mean spiteful? Biden has been running for president for like 40 years at this point, okay? He ran for president for 40 fucking years, and he finally got it. And when you hear him say, they always ruled me out, but I won time and time again, okay? He's right. That is like, that isn't just, um, you made this exact same tweet two days ago. I know, I keep, I keep doing it again and again. Biden isn't trying to get across the finish line on November 5th. He's trying to actively run out the clock until the convention so that it's far too late to swap him out without consequence. It's an insanely selfish strategy from a spiteful man. I know. Why are you calling me out? So is it against the rules or something for the DNC to change their nominee after the convention? Yes, the convention is where you uh, officially designate the nominee. Obviously, if someone dies after the convention, that would be chaotic. But like there, I'm sure there is like a, like a mechanism there. But um, But no, you... Like the convention is, is the finale. Like that's it. That's, it would be virtually impossible after uh, the convention to swap them out. And even in the convention, there's like, obviously the DNC could technically choose whoever the fuck they want. Okay. Obviously at the convention, the DNC could technically legally choose whoever they want as their candidate. Like actually, that is like a thing that they could do. Please change your profile pic. Um, I'll change it. If you can find that same pick without the fucking uh, LGBT background, but you know, I'm not going to do that on my own. Uh, don't change it. I do want to change it. It's just like, I'm too lazy to change it myself. Um, yeah, we got, we got the Lieutenant governor of New York as well. Hold on. We're here. I'll change it. I'll change my Twitter profile pick now. Change it. I'll change it right now. What the fuck? It's a different hat. How did you find that? I changed it. I've done that with a different hat as well. That's crazy. Is the Mr. Beast thing a meme or did he say something? No, he did say it. Um, did you cover the Clooney article yet? No, not yet. You're just a one trick pony. President Biden is the nominee and we support the Democratic nominee. Are you confident that President Biden has what it takes to win in November and serve the next four years? As I've said before, I'm with Joe. All of it putting some members who have concerns in a box. We have no choice but to you know, support him as our nominee and make the best of a complicated situation. Uh, I mean, that's the concession to the political reality we face. But this morning, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi stopped short of saying he should run and said Democrats should hold off until they see how this week goes. It's up to the president to decide if he is going to. I like that. I like that the media is not even like playing along with Nancy Pelosi's like wishy-washy centrism and immediately cutting through that noise and going, yeah, no, she said, you know, we'll wait. We'll wait this week out. Like, they could so... She delivers that statement in a way that allows... In a way that allows uh, the media to cover it as, uh, as like, Nancy Pelosi uh, reaffirms her commitment to Biden. You know what I mean? But nope, they're not even doing that. They're just straight up going, nope, she meant 
wait for the week to end to run uh, we're all encouraging him uh to to make that decision uh because time is running short democrats are closely watching how biden performs on the world stage during the nato summit we gather to proclaim nato is ready and able to secure that vision today and well into the future the president's rival former president donald trump has largely remained out of sight returning to the campaign trail for the first time since the debate. It doesn't matter who they nominate because we are going to beat any one of them in thundering landslides. So back here on Capitol Hill, most Democrats telling us they're accepting the reality that even if they have concerns, there's really not much they can do about it. The president is vowing to stay in the race. Democratic leadership is rallying behind him. One thing that Democrats are watching tomorrow, that press conference that the president is expected to give, where he's expected to take a number of questions from reporters, George. And Rachel, Donald Trump closing in on a VP pick. Yeah, Donald Trump's advisors say that he is expected to announce who his running mate will be by next Monday. That is just as the Republican National Convention gets underway. Sources tell us it is down to a final three. Senator J.D. Vance, Senator Marco Rubio, and North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. But sources Burgum tell us as of this morning, Trump has still not made a... I'm such a burger boy, dude. I am, I am literally, I'm out of my god dang mind with this burger nonsense, okay? We're, I'm holding out hope. I'm holding out hope. I'm holding out hope. He can win if you vote for him, chat. Doug Burgum, let's go. Burger maniacs, rise up. Burger boys, rise up. We're out here. North Dakota heads, okay? Doug Burgum mentioned. You voting Trump burger? If he puts Burgum on the ticket, maybe. Who knows, man? Who knows? I'm from ND, and that's embarrassing. No, it's not. North Dakota, best Dakota. Bergam is going to be the pig literally because he's a rich pussy. No, I don't think Bergam is going to be the pig. I think it's going to be J.D. Vance. But that's, you know, I think it's going to be J.D. Vance. But I've been saying it's going to be J.D. Vance for some time now. But I do love Bergam personally. I've been a Bergam maniac for a while. Okay. Burgum maniacs in control. Why do you like Burgum? Who is he? It's a meme, man. It's just, he's the governor of North Dakota, our best state. He's the governor of the most important state in America, North Dakota. Okay. He's also, he also sold his company to fucking Bill Gates. He's like a billionaire. He's a real socialist. He paid people $20 to donate $1 to his campaign. Yeah. That's real socialism. And he will do that. Okay. Uh, Trump said Marco when talking about beating Trump at a rally. I don't know if it was a slip or something. I would be shocked if he went with fucking little Marco, dude. Are you kidding me? Yes, I know there's a new interview coming out with NBC. Okay, I know. All right, let's continue. Trump also popping off yesterday in Florida at his rally. Turned around, turned around, and straight up demanded another debate. He is... Woo -woo. He's having a good time with this. To politics Boy. now, former President Donald Trump was out in the heat last night in Florida at a rally at one of his golf courses there. And in front of the overheated crowd, he took aim at President Biden's health and issued a new debate challenge. Meanwhile, President Biden gave a major speech to NATO in Washington yesterday as he tries to show he has the energy to keep doing this job. Our team is covering both sides of that story, but we're going to start with Caitlin Huey Burns, who's at the Trump rally or was last night there in steamy Miami. Caitlin, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Tony. Well, at that rally last night, Donald Trump wasted no time going after his rival. He actually challenged Biden to another debate this week without moderators. And in a nod to a more memorable exchange from the last debate, he also challenged Biden to a golf match. Former President Donald Trump back on the campaign trail for the first time in over 10 days. Joe is, in fact, all talk and no action. Capitalizing on President Biden's struggles with his own party. Joe's own party now wants him to throw in the towel and surrender the presidency after a single 90-minute performance. With the Republican National Convention starting on Monday, Trump is preparing to announce his running mate. One of the contenders joined him last night. Florida Senator Marco Rubio stepped up the attacks against Vice President Kamala Harris. Of all the crazy left-wing policies that they want for our country, she supported every single one of them. As for Republican policies, like the only benefit that Marco, little Marco gives Trump, I guess, is that he's like 
seen as like a more reasonable Republican. So it, it's a way to center him. But um, I don't know how, how much play he has with like um, it, investors or donors rather in the way that like J.D. Vance opens up like an entire avenue of Silicon Valley style donors, specifically Peter Thiel. Trump relies on that. Uh, Latino too. I don't think anybody gives a shit about that. Like, what do you guys think that the fucking, you guys think that the Cuban vote is not 98% Bashar al-Assad numbers for Donald Trump in Florida? What are we talking about? Like, <laughs> yeah, he really needs, <laughs> he really needs Marco Rubio to pack up the Cuban vote, dude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's fine. Okay. He doesn't need Marco Rubio for that shit. The RNC approved a platform this week that makes no mention of a decades-long call for a national abortion ban and adopted Trump's stance that laws governing reproductive rights should be left to the states. Also on Tuesday, Nikki Haley, who challenged Trump for the nomination, encouraged her delegates to move their support to Trump, saying the convention is a time for Republican unity, adding Joe Biden is not competent to serve a second term. But Trump supporters are more than happy to run against him. I saw a different Trump the last debate, which was nice. He was, he was a, a little bit uh, mild-mannered, not as boisterous, not as angry. Do you want Biden to run against Trump? Absolutely. Dude, it's great. Uh, the, the Trump team is relying on the short-term memory loss that Americans have to basically moderate his positions, moderate the Republican Party's positions, make it seem like they're actually a totally different Republican Party than the one that has, like, communicated how fucking insane they are. Okay? It's awesome. Like, you look at, you look at their policies, you look at, like, what... I mean, I guess, like, it's laughable because they don't... They purposefully usually don't mention policies in general and just go off of vibes and resentment and anger and, you know, wanting to kill migrants. But, um, basically... Basically, they're just like, hey, uh, we're totally different, actually. Like, we promise. We're so different. We're so different than the way you think we are, you know? We promise we're different. We're gonna... What is this abortion stuff? We love abortion. Project 2025? I don't even know what the fuck that is. What is Project 2025? What is that? Like, what, 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 I don't even know what that is. Heritage Foundation? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. We're pro-abortion, actually, pretty much. You know, abortion should be between a, a man, uh, not a man, sorry. Abortion should be between a woman and her medical professional. Now, when it comes to that golf match, Biden's campaign said in a statement last night that the president doesn't have time for, quote, Trump's weird antics. Donald Trump will be back on the campaign trail on Saturday with a rally in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. And the Republican National Convention, of course, starts next week in Milwaukee. All right, Caitlin, thank you. The Democratic infighting over President Biden's futures boiling over. So as we were talking, covering all this news, as I mentioned, that eighth House Democrat, he's a New York congressman, Pat Ryan, he's described as a moderate. Well, he's now urging Biden to step aside. He says that it's a, quote, grave disservice to call Biden the party's best candidate. So he said that, but he also tied it to his fears about President Trump. He calls President Trump an existential threat. And a lot of Democratic commentators have made the point, so someone's an existential threat, but you're not putting up your best candidate. It doesn't make sense. You can't have it both ways. Also, during our show... Now, someone was me. I'm the someone. I'm the one who said that. Joe, Senator Blumenthal, who just yesterday said, Biden is the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. He has my support. He needs to aggressively make his case moments ago said this, I am deeply concerned about President Biden. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. Pelosi comes out. She makes these comments. Jake Sherman says a bomb goes off on Capitol Hill. And now all of a sudden, the messaging is mixed. It's all over. So we're getting all of that. Exclusive new reaction. More to come about George Clooney's call for President Biden to bow out. Every congressman being chased down the hall. And here's what Tennessee Democrat Steve Cohen had to say on that. George Clooney just said in the New York Times that Biden needs to step down. Are you worried that now Democrats in Congress, now you have Hollywood, are saying Biden is not mentally fit? George Clooney is a movie producer. He needs to produce movies. He's a movie producer. He also
also now raised your fourteen million for your guy three weeks ago. So yeah, yeah, you have that. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Compar. So let's talk about George Jebediah Clooney, okay? Mr. Phony, Mr. Motherfucking Phony, Mr. Fake Friend. He wrote an op-ed, a guest essay for the New York Times. He said, I love Joe Biden, but we need a new nominee. Now, one of the most important parts of this article isn't necessarily that George Clooney uh, has raised money for Joe Biden only like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It isn't the fact that he's calling for him to step down. Many other donors have also called him to step down. Now, the real reason why this is pretty significant is because why he wants Joe Biden to step down. Because many of you saw Joe Biden's horrible performance on the debate stage. Okay? George Clooney, on the other hand, didn't just get to see that debate performance. George Clooney was side by side with Joe Biden. Let's go to Dana Bash. George Clooney got to experience Joe Biden in person. That is the real scary part of this equation. That's the scary part of this conversation. George Clooney saw Joe Biden in person and was like, oh my God, that's bad. As a matter of fact, it's as bad as what you saw on the debate stage. So that's a, that's a real scary prospect, much scarier than being caught with your dick out at the top of the hour with no subscription when there's a three-minute ad break coming for you. Because at the top of the hour, there is a three-minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free. With the Twitch Prime, you can subscribe for free. Here's a three-minute ad break. Now, now let me tell you something. Isn't this good, not scary? I mean, it's kind of scary that like a dude who stood side by side with the president who raised a shit ton of money for him is literally saying like, no, his, he's pooping his diapers. And he's not the only famous George that has stood side by side with the president, the current sitting president. George Stephanopoulos also had a beat. A TMZ person came up to him with a, you know, with, a, with their iPhone out filming a private conversation where he said, hey, what do you think about the president? Like, you saw him, you were next to him. Like, do you think you should stay in the race? And George Stephanopoulos famously yesterday said, no. He said, nah, he shouldn't stay uh, in the race. He's not fit for office. Here it is. Hey, excuse me. Hey, how you doing? Uh, what do you think? Do you think Biden should step down? You talk to him more than anybody else have lately. And you can be honest. You don't he said, I don't think he can serve four more years. He said, yeah, I did sit next to him. I did sit down with him and I did talk. Now, at first we we're like, oh, is that actually George Stephanopoulos? Do we know if he actually said that? Turns out he did. Because he openly stated that he did. Okay. He came out last night and said, yeah, I shouldn't have, you know, I shouldn't have said that, but it, it was me. I did say that. And, you know, it was... Uh, Basically, he says something along the lines of like, uh, you know, I, it was me. I should be more careful with what I say to random people on the street. That's, that's it. Okay. Just saying, these are people who literally are fucking around Joe Biden who uh, are not named Jill Biden or Hunter Biden. Okay. People who have been around Joe Biden for extended periods of time, like, you know, having this position is pretty fucking scary. Another House Democrat is calling on Joe Biden to drop out of the race. Moderate New York Congressman Pat Ryan is now the eighth elected Democrat to do so publicly. Of course, President Biden has no shortage of critics right now. Some of his toughest are coming from those who worked inside the Obama-Biden administration, like the co-hosts of the podcast, Pod Save America. They served as speechwriters to the former President Obama. This is a campaign that is being, and a White House that is being let down by their principal over and over and over again. It was a terrible interview. He did a terrible job articulating why he's in the race, what happened at the debate, and why he's the person to beat Trump. He's doing a terrible job. Joining me now is one of the co-hosts of that podcast, John Favreau, Obama's former chief speechwriter and the co-author of the. Hey, Hassan, why don't you have the same energy towards Ukraine, the multicultural, diverse nation of 50 million people, 20 million now, who decided in 2014 to be a mono-ethical state, ethnical state, banning Bulgakov, Pushkin, Turgenev, Victory Day, 
and having the butchers of SS as national heroes as you do towards the Israeli state who is practicing some mono-ethnical policy. Um, I don't know, because uh, Israel is not being invaded by a much larger nation uh, and, and having their citizens be fucking slaughtered. Israel has conducted a 75-year occup 76-year occupation on a territory that does not belong to them uh, that is comprised of an indigenous population. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> The dynamic is, is genuinely different between, you know, Ukraine. I love that. I love that sometimes people, I love when people turn around and go, yeah, dude, I'm actually pro-Palestine and pro-Russia. It's just like, doesn't make any fucking sense. Like how are you just, you know, this guy is Z, correct? This is not a, this is not a, uh, a, a, a good way to craft an argument okay it's as bad as the dipshits that are pro-ukraine and pro-israel i mean just idiotic we're gonna do the new york poll in a second and why the new york uh why the new york politicians are coming out and demanding biden drop out but that's gonna come up in a second let's continue the new book democracy or else john's one-time former boss is also <laughs> here former obama senior advisor david axelrod now of course a senior cnn contributor Thank you both for being here. John Favreau, I'm going to start with you because, first of all, uh, Axe, I did listen to Hacks on Tap, so I'll get to that in a second. But I listened to the entire um, episode. I think you dropped it yesterday. I mean, it gave me so much anxiety. I could feel the frustration coming through the car speakers as I was listening to it and then my earbuds. And so the question is that I have for you is, I'm putting myself in the position of the Biden campaign right now, of the White House. And that is, you guys are so angry and you guys are so upset. Are you hurting more than helping by saying so much about what you're saying publicly? No, I think what's, what's hurting Joe Biden right now is not only the debate performance, but the response to the debate performance in that he has been unable to articulate a coherent and compelling argument against Donald Trump, who I believe represents an existential threat to our democracy. And the debate did not, uh, the voters had concerns about Joe Biden's age and fitness for the job long before the debate. I, an overwhelming majority of voters did, and the debate amplified those concerns in a way that was very visceral for voters to see. And so it's like, it really doesn't matter what I think, but it's- Z Parvers equals Ukraine should not lean towards the US and have engaged in a civil war that killed more than 13,000 people on East Sodom or Progressive, by the way. Dude, you're, you're masking what the actual sentiment here is. Please, oh my God, you guys are just as annoying as the fucking Ukrainian flag in the bio people, dude. Jesus fucking Christ. Holy shit. It's so- fucking annoying it makes me lose my goddamn mind dude it's like long-term community members too there is no way to justify russia's invasion of ukraine this is not me posturing to like secretly fucking win back some of these nato andes like it's ridiculous part of the reason why i hype up china regardless of how much they fucking uh those very same people lose their shit over china is because they demonstrate a lot of reservation in terms of making insane moves in the same way that Russia does. The other reason, of course, is because, you know, China has actively made a, a lot more movement in terms of or urbanization, rapid urbanization, rapid development, like uh, in, their, uh, in their own personal domestic affairs. Their foreign policy is very different than Russia. Russia is infinitely more volatile and also a obvious right-wing hyper-nationalist kleptocracy run by a bunch of fucking oligarchs that we put into positions of power, okay? Our defensible positions in terms of America's foreign adversaries uh, and, and uh, America's foreign adversaries that demonstrate restraint, and then there are indefensible positions. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is completely and utterly indefensible. The argument of saving the LPR and DPR is ridiculous, considering the death toll on both sides since the invasion of Ukraine, okay? In everything east of the Dnieper River, it's ridiculous. Who the fuck are you saving? You just killed infinitely more people, okay? The argument that, oh, this is going to be, this, was, this had to be done. 
in order to protect, uh, in order to ensure that NATO is not uh, going to be prominent in Ukraine is also ridiculous, especially considering that NATO is stronger than it was before Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia could have, Vladimir Putin could have continued beefing up his trade relations with European partners, refusing to do insane shit, insanely violent shit in Ukraine. It would have been infinitely more defensible if that was the case. Instead, he turned around and said, Ukraine is actually Russian territory. We are of one nation. We have to forcibly take it. No, nah, NATO is weaker. Europe is weaker. That's just maximalist copium. NATO is weaker is ridiculous, dude. NATO got the most popular mandate it has ever had. It was the greatest gift to NATO admirals, NATO generals. There is absolutely zero justification for invading a foreign nation like this, okay? There's just no... There is no fucking reasoning. You're crazy. Not only that, but also even areas... You really think Russia wants to annex all of Ukraine? It doesn't matter. What, do, what are we talking about? Annexing Eastern Ukraine is also completely unacceptable. Also, blowing up Eastern Ukraine is also completely unacceptable. Think about all the fucking deaths that have occurred so far. That's insane. And now Finland and Sweden have also joined NATO. Come on, dude. Please. Calm the fuck down. Ukraine has also blown up Eastern Ukraine for many years now. I know, dude. Yeah. Just like Hamas kills his own citizens, which is why Israel killing every Palestinian is actually the much better choice. Do you not notice how much your argument resembles the Israeli position when you try to subtly defend Russia? It's crazy. People are saying this after Russia blew up a hospital. Yeah. And then, and then turned around and was like, no, it must have been a, it must have been a, a, a Hamas rocket. Most Ukraine war hawks are also Israel supports 95% of them. I, that doesn't matter. Am I one of those people? Am I a Ukraine war hawk as a matter of fact? Do you think that I have been, do you think that I have not been fucking advocating for a ceasefire in Ukraine when Ukraine had a much more favorable position years ago? I have. I am not pro NATO. I want a ceasefire in Ukraine, but it's ridiculous that so many people just like, so many people just take this weird stance here. You're the biggest of war, war hawks. Yeah, I know. I'm such a big war hawk. That's why I'm always fucking advocating to end wars globally. That's what a war hawk is. Ugh. Yeah, that ceasefire will never happen under NATO slash US influence. Yeah, dude. Russia small bean. Russia operates uh, in, in Russia, much like Israel, operates like a naturally occurring phenomena. It's a hurricane. It's a typhoon. It's a volcano. It's an earthquake. Like, what are we talking about? There are two sides to this, okay? Obviously, it's a ridiculous thing to be like, oh, why don't you tell Russia to do a ceasefire? Like, if someone comes in here and says something like that, I'm like, okay, dude, yeah. Let me tell, let me call up Vladimir Putin right now and be like, hey, pooty poo, stop that right now, you know? It's, as, it's akin to being like, oh, why is nobody asking Hamas to release the hostages? Why is nobody asking Hamas to do a ceasefire? Not what I said at all. I know that's not what you said. I'm saying someone who is on the opposite side of your position would probably take a stance like that. Okay? Someone who is like unconditionally pro-Ukraine, unconditionally anti-Russia, uh, Ukrainian flag in the bio, all this stuff. Like they, That's what they would tell me in this situation when I talk about ceasefire and America's involvement in Ukraine and America's responsibility to ensure that more deaths do not happen. Okay, all of NAFO is with Israel. What are you talking about? I'm not. So why the fuck do I care? I hate those guys. Bringing up those people in this conversation is idiotic. You can't talk to me about my position. So you just bring up random irrelevant shit. NAFO is like 30 people on Twitter with the Ukrainian flag in their bio. And you're over here talking about NAFO. Like, what the fuck is NAFO? I've never learned about what it is. I still don't know what the acronym means. And I do not want to learn what it means, okay? Do not tell me about some Reddit shit. You know, why aren't, why aren't people asking? Why aren't people asking Trump to step down? It's quite suspicious. It's very suspicious. Anyway, North American fart odor. odor North Atlantic. What? F? Organization? Anyway. North American foreign occupation. 
What's your take on the best possible future for Ukrainian workers, especially post-war, assuming some kind of negotiation? I don't know. Um, and I just, I don't want to talk about this any further, okay, until we get to the NATO conversation. We're talking about Biden right now. There is no good future for Ukraine, nor is there any good future for Russia, nor is there really any good future for the United States of America right now. So I, I hope that the Biden campaign and that President Biden will just like look at the listen to the voters. Right. And, and the overwhelming majority of whom do not like Donald Trump, do not think Donald Trump is honest, but have had concerns for a couple of years now that Joe Biden is not fit for another four years because of his age. And a majority of voters didn't have that concern in 2020. I want you both to listen to what the former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said on MSNBC this morning. It's up to the president to decide if he is going to run. Uh, we're all encouraging him uh, to to make that decision. I want him to do hips like Cinderella. They give it the five to run. Give do the whatever subs. he decides to do, and that's that's the way it is. David, I'll start with you. The significance of that. I think very significant. First of all, as you know, uh, I think you said earlier in your show here, Nancy Pelosi is a very deliberate person. Uh, she says what she wants to say. She never says what she doesn't want to say. Uh, she said that for a reason. The president tried to close down this discussion at the beginning of the week with his letter to the House. And what she's saying uh, delicately and respectfully is, no, really, the discussion isn't over. And we still need to have this discussion because she's hearing from members all over the country. They all poll. They all talk to their constituents. And uh, they're worried not just about the existential threat of Donald Trump becoming president again, but also the effect that it's going to have on all of their races and the prospect of recapturing the House. So I think the leaders are trying to be respectful and supportive. Uh, of the president and uh, leave the decision to him. But I think they're going to want to make sure that he makes that decision based on real information. And the real information is not encouraging. And so the question is, how much of that real information is he getting? Um, you know, for example, now the Stephanopoulos interview was, was several days ago at this point, but he said uh, the only person at, at that point that he knew that who really wanted him to get out in the Senate among his former colleagues was Mark Warner. Um, John, you and, well, David, I think, has gone a little bit further in saying that effectively that President Biden should step aside. Correct me if I'm mischaracterizing your position, David. But, John, do, do you think it, it would help at this point for people like you and elected officials who have microphones and megaphones to be more specific publicly? Or is it better to continue to press this case privately with the president? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I'm sure that pressing the case privately to the president. Is Brandon now surrounded by yes men at this point is your question, right? The answer is he absolutely is almost entirely sheltered from opposition at this point. His family is standing with him, his wife, Jill, and sister, Valerie, who Democrats relied upon to provide wise counsel, not just cheerleading. His son, Hunter, has been seen at the White House so much lately that one well-connected lawyer slash lobbyist Democrat dubbed him the acting chief of staff. He's the gatekeeper. He's the one who's bucking up his dad. That is surely, that is surely going to be a phenomenal, a, a phenomenal development for the, uh, we are the non-chaotic party position that the Democrats are trying to desperately hold on to. The article, How Hunter Biden Became His Father's Gatekeeper. There is perhaps not a worse fucking thing that the Biden administration could do right now. Republicans have literally set up Hunter Biden as like the biggest cudgel to Brandon's reelection. For four years, they tried to set up Hunter Biden as a, as a, as a propaganda point against Joe Biden in the last election cycle. It failed. Why did it fail? Because you could just so easily say, why the fuck does, uh, why is Hunter Biden even remotely relevant? He is nowhere near the White House. So what do you do after he gets convicted? What do you do? You bring him into the White House for the past four years. The easiest thing that 
the administration could say is like, yeah, Hunter Biden uh, is, is his own person. He is not relevant to Joe Biden's administration. He's not relevant to his reelection. That was the easiest way to fucking neutralize the argument that Hunter Biden is like uh, this, this secret thought leader in the, in, the, uh, in the branded administration. And they fucking turned around and brought him into the White House. But do white suburban moms actually buy this? Are these people leaning Dem right now who care about the Hunter Biden shit that much? No, no. But what you fail to rem what you fail to consider is that that those past four years of anti Hunter Biden propaganda, and also beyond the anti Hunter Biden propaganda, is still going to be heard by moderates, moderates who think the Trump administration was too chaotic moderates that the Democratic Party have been desperately trying to signal to pendant voters and moderates who may have even voted for the Republican Party in the past, voted for Donald Trump in the past, that turned around in 2020 and voted for Joe Biden because Joe Biden is an elder statesman. Joe Biden actually means business as usual politics. Joe Biden means we can go back to fucking brunch. No more paying attention to Trump. No more antics. No more chaos. No more commotion. No more confusion. When you take a convicted felon, if you think people care about someone's convicted felon status, as many independents and many moderates, of course, care about Donald Trump's convicted felon status, they are absolutely going to see your crackhead fail son in the White House and all this coverage on your crackhead fail son in the White House being now this, uh, this, this secret chief of staff. And they're going to go, what the fuck is happening? This is why we didn't vote for Trump. This is why we voted for Joe. The fuck we want a cokehead fail son of the White House. That's crazy. I don't want that shit. Oh, I thought you wanted DNC press access, Lamau. I mean, that's entirely separate from this conversation. I'm not going to like uh, hide my opinions on uh, what I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to edit my opinions, dude. So I can get a fucking press pass to the DNC. That's crazy. Don't be ridiculous. Like, those are memes for the most part. Also, a lot of what I'm saying is not, is not necessarily, you know, crazy. What I'm saying is unironically more pro-Democratic Party uh, and, and uh, pro-Democratic Party actually winning re-election than uh, what the Brandon administration is doing currently, what the Brandon campaign is doing currently, okay? I might not necessarily be the biggest fan of the Democratic Party, nor Joseph, Robin, and Brandon, but that doesn't change the reality that like what I'm saying currently is 100% correct and could be read as pro-democratic party. Okay. Fuck it. Even pro Joe Biden. Don't bring Hunter Biden into the white house and, and uh, show the moderates that you've been desperately trying to cling on to that you are just as chaotic and just as silly as Donald Trump is literally a it could be read as a pro-Biden strategy, even. President is going to be the ultimate thing that, that um, if he decides to step down, that's, that's what's going to do it. But I do think the reason that I keep talking about it, the reason that a lot of people keep talking about it, is because President Biden and his advisors are having these conversations with elected officials. The president does respect Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, um, all of these people around him that he's served with for years, uh, and, I'm, and his advisors mm -hmm. as well. And I do think that if they all gave him an honest accounting of what the numbers are right now and, and and what voters' concerns are, then I I still believe that Joe Biden would make what I think would be a very courageous, honorable decision to say, I want to, you know, finish out my, my job as president here in the next couple months, but I want to pass the torch to the next generation. And, and David, answer uh, my question, but also I want you to sort of play with another notion, a broader notion beyond... President Biden, which is Richie Torres told me this morning, Democrats are headed for a suicide mission politically. You heard Michael Bennett on with Caitlin last night saying that it's not just the presidency at stake, House and Senate Democrats are going to get wiped out. Um, you, you worked in the White House. You were both in the White House when there was, <laughs> I don't know about a wipeout, but it was, uh, I'll, I'll quote your former boss. He got shellacked. Democrats got shellacked. Um, mm -hmm. Very different circumstances, but is that where you see November headed? Look, um, if the polling numbers that we see today uh, are anything like the numbers 
at uh, on in November, um, I think that uh, gravity will take hold. Uh, you can't run right now. This polling is showing, for example, Senator Baldwin in Wisconsin running 12 points ahead of Biden. I think the same is true of Senator Rosen in Nevada. Uh, you know, Bob Casey in Pennsylvania running well ahead of him. But you know, the history. Uh, I, there's there's there are very few cases uh, of senators in the last several cycles and presidential cycles who win when mm -hmm. their presidential candidate is losing. And so I think there's real fear, not just for the senators, but for uh, representatives in these swing district, frontline districts. And a lot of Democrats think the House may be the last line of defense if Trump wins the election. So there's a lot of concern yeah. about this. If President Biden does withdraw from the race, replacing him at the top of the ticket could be chaotic. But here's what a top Biden fundraiser and longtime supporter George Clooney said about that in his op-ed this morning. Would it be messy? Yes, dem democracy is messy, but would it enliven our party and wake up voters who long before the June debate had already checked out? It sure would. The short ramp to Election Day would be a benefit for us, not a danger. John Favreau and David Axelrod are back with me. Um, Ax, what do you think about that Ax. argument? Look, I, I think there's merit to it. You know, sometimes you, you, this is all a matter of risk assessment. There's risk associated with everything. The question is whether the risk of the status quo eclipses the risk of trying uh, something else. And I think we've reached the point where many are, are have come to that conclusion. But the thing about the peace, Dana, that I thought was particularly impactful was Clooney, who just uh, hosted a fundraiser, a major fundraiser for the president, a few weeks ago in California said he, the, you can't win the battle against time. None of us can. It's devastating to say. But Joe Biden, I was the Joe yeah. Biden I was with three weeks ago. The fundraiser was not the Joe Biden of 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. He was the same man yeah. we all witnessed at the debate. That is devastating. That's devastating. Yeah. And that's and it's what people fear. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to ask uh, John about, because, John, you were at that fundraiser as well. I don't know if you spent as much time with President Biden as George Clooney did since he was one of the hosts. But that, that's the biggest line. I, I'm totally with you, David. That quote was like, wow. I mean, it was not surprising. That is the biggest line. That's what I wanted to stress the importance of. Not one, but two Georges who have been around Biden recently have said that he is not fit to serve he is not fit to be in office he is not fit to run for re-election that is unimaginably devastating that's terrifying that's crazy think about that response to those comments from george clooney jake a campaign official who attended that los angeles fundraiser tells me that george clooney left three hours before the president so clearly the gloves are off jake what, but what does that mean? What? 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 What is that? Are you, is the team saying that Biden is more dynamic than George Clooney? Like, is that what their, is that what their argument is? Isn't that worse? Isn't, doesn't that mean that he like saw what was going on and was like, I can't be here. Like. I don't want to fucking be here. Like George Clooney, George Clooney literally was like, Oh my God. I mean, sure. We'll fundraise, but God damn, the situation is dire. <laughs> wow. What a banger retort, dude. Thank you to the, the Biden team doing it again. <laughs> damn. They have such a fine way of uh, way with words. Like the expectation from the public that hears this is supposed to be what that like, we're now going to assume that actually Biden is more dynamic than George fucking Clooney. Okay, you got me. And then George Clooney left for what's... With all due respect, can you stop using disposable forks, please? No, I fucking hate the environment. When, when someone, when the food that I deliver sends me disposable forks, I hate the environment so much, I actually directly feed it to a pet turtle. What do you want me to do? It's not like I'm demanding to get these fucking forks but they send it and there's no way for me to not get it. So what do you want? You think I like these fucking dumbass plastic forks? I don't. They suck. What's the point? The point of that is to suggest that 
Biden's stamina is better than Clooney's, and Clooney didn't have, you know, eyes on the entire event. That's the response uh, to uh, to the Clooney op-ed. Okay. In response to those comments from okay. George Clooney, Jake, a campaign official who attended that Los Angeles fundraiser tells me that. He asked you politely not to use them, just throw them away without using them. Yeah. I'm doing my part to save the planet by directly throwing the forks without even using them. Surprising to any of us who were at the fundraiser. Uh, mm -hmm. I was there. It, Clooney was exactly right. And every single person I talked to at the fundraiser thought the same thing, except for the you know, people working for Joe Biden, or at least they didn't say that. But I remember my wife, Emily, turned to me after the fundraiser and said, what are we going to do? I mean, and I said, mm -hmm. well, there's a debate in a week. Either he'll do well in the debate and we'll think, well, he was just tired because he flew all the way back from Europe and that'll be that. Or he'll be like this at the debate and then the whole country will be talking about it. And so here we are. Wow. Uh, please come back, both of you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, fascinating conversation. This just in the scene. And a big Democratic donor, George Clooney, of course, the actor has just called for President Biden to step aside. CNN's Arlette Sign joins us now from the White House. Arlette, obviously, uh, this is not going to be welcome news over there. What can you tell us? No, it won't be, Jim. And this is a significant uh, new New York Times op-ed from actor George Clooney. Now, to remind viewers, George Clooney was one of those celebrities that headlined a major Los Angeles fundraiser with President Biden back in June. And today, he is saying that he believes it is time for President Biden to step aside from this 2024 campaign. Now, George uh, Clooney wrote extensively about President Biden saying, we are not going to win in November. We with this president, he recounted uh, being with Biden at that fundraiser, saying it's devastating to say it, but the Joe Biden I was with three weeks ago at the fundraiser was not the Joe big effing deal Biden of 2010. He wasn't even the Joe Biden of 2020. He was the same man we all witnessed on at that debate. He goes on to say our party leaders need to stop telling us that 51 million people didn't see what we just saw. We're also terrified by the prospect of a second Trump term that we've offered to ignore every warning side. This is uh, significant as, of course, George Clooney holds a very large platform. He is well known, but he has also been a longtime Democratic supporter, fundraising not just for Joe Biden, but also for former President uh, Barack Obama. Now, it comes, as you have heard, these deep reservations expressed from various wings of the Democratic Party, from some lawmakers up on Capitol Hill, some donors also indicating that they are concerned about what it would mean to have President Biden at the top of the Democratic ticket uh, in November after that debate. And now you are hearing George Clooney, a key Democratic supporter, key actor, key activist, adding to that chorus of calls for President Biden to step aside. Now, President Biden and his team are simply charging ahead with this campaign at this moment. President Biden right now is... People are like, oh, why do, why do we care what George Clooney has to say? I don't give a shit. But obviously... When I say Joe Biden is fucking demented and old since 2019, nobody gives a fuck, okay? The unfortunate reality is this is the situation in front of us. Nobody gives a shit about what the, do what the, what the actual voters have to say. Nobody gives a shit about what, like, you know, people like myself have to fucking say, people like you have to say. They care about a guy who raised $14.5 million in one night for the Democratic Party has to say, though. A person who, by the way, make no mistake, has a direct line of communication with Barack Obama as well. George Clooney is homies with Barack. Like, straight up, they hang out. Like, they have, he has a direct line of communication for Obama. I suspect he's probably had a conversation with him as well about this article before he wrote it speaking at an AFL-CIO meeting as he's trying to shore up support among union leaders uh, who the campaign believes would be key heading into a November election. But certainly this is another pressure point for President Biden as they are having a, a major Democratic name call for him to step aside at this moment. Yeah, Arlette, they're not going to be happy about that. And speaking of the president being at the AFL-CIO, the big union that's headquartered here in Washington, uh, he was just speaking there moments ago. Let's listen to a bit of that uh, and hear what he had to say. Hey, folks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, sit down, sit down. Hey, look, number one, uh, you know, the way I look at it, I was thinking about this last night, no one's going to be here and going from here to the NATO summit. You know, we have two strong, strong organizations in America that I look to for our security. 
One, literally, and I mean this sincerely, is NATO. NATO, a joint assembly of democracies that made sure we're keeping the peace, and no one's going to screw around with us as strong as it's ever been. And I think of you as my domestic NATO, not a joke, not a joke. You're the ones, you're the ones beyond me, and, you know, you, you know, Matt. He ain't wrong. He's saying the AFL-CIA. He said the AFL-CIA and NATO, two sides of the same coin. <laughs> Not a joke. Both the AFL-CIA and NATO doing the damn thing. Right with us better than I do. Beyond me, it's all about whether or not we're going to grow the economy, whether we're going to give working people a shot. And I told you, and you know, because you, a lot of you were there with me all the way back when I was a kid, and I'm only 42, but when I was a kid, back running for the Senate when I was 29 years old, labor elected me. And we were then a right-to-work state, and we, we changed it all. And here's what we're doing. You are, you've heard me say it a thousand times, I'm going to say it again. The middle class built this country. You built the middle class. No, no, no. And by the way, I don't want to hurt your reputations, but even Wall Street's acknowledging your power. No, I'm serious. Look at every projection about what we want to do with the economy on the issues that we're talking about and what the other guy wants to do. They're supporting us. It's your agenda we're working on. And by the way, I've said from the beginning that when labor does well, everybody does better. Not, not, not a joke. That, that's not a talking point. That is a reality. You know that, Lee. That is a reality. What makes me so sad is that, like, this is actually nominal politicking. Like, he's just the worst person to say it. Like, it makes me so sad that he's doing, like, Bernie Sanders-style rhetoric so good, and it's just coming from him. It literally makes the argument worse. It's not even entirely insincere, Chatters. That's the other side of this conversation. It's not even completely empty, and it's not even completely insincere, okay? That's the, that is the reality here. His administration has unironically been more pro-labor than the fucking uh, Barack Obama administration is hailed as like a progressive champion. And it's just like, it, it makes it so, it makes the situation all the, <laughs> it makes the situation much worse. Bro, don't you remember him standing up for the railroad union? Oh, wait. Yeah, I know. A lot of you don't know the exact details of what happened in the railroad union negotiations. And that is yet another aspect of the fucking horrible communications strategy and the horrible political instincts of the Brandon camp in general. That's why you come in here and you still say, wow, what about the railroad union where he, he union busted? Like he did. And then he turned around and forced the unions by way of Pete Buttigieg to actually make some concessions. It's literally, you, you you don't have the full story there. I am not I am not a fucking fan of Joe Biden. You know this, okay? It's the most labor-friendly administration slash union. Uh, yeah, by union standards, not that much. No, it is. It 100% is. It absolutely is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He met, he forced the companies to make concessions. Sorry. Not the unions. I apologize. He forced them back to work, dog. What the fuck are you talking about? Do we want to just have talking points that we blurt out? Or do you want to actually know what happened? Like, cause if you want to just keep doing Reddit style, fucking, I don't know, Reddit style argumentation in here and just chirp with talking points and, and, um, tweet like you're a fucking hammer and sickle radical on Twitter. That's one thing. Okay. Or do you want to actually know what legitimately happened? You're wrong. If you think that Biden's administration, which is a low bar to clear, is not the most openly pro labor union administration since like FDR. Okay. I'm sorry. I know. I hate the guy. He's a genocide heir, but <laughs> that is the reality. Dog, you forced them back. Kerala Kush covered the situation far more extensively than you. You don't know what you're talking about. Four paid sick days. Let me fail. Oh my God. I'm not saying he turned around and gave the unions all of their demands. Okay. And yes, I covered it nonstop. What are we talking about? This is not a good thing. This is not 
This is... Hmm. My mom is a union uh, machinist rep, and Biden's NLRB has been the most pro-labor president in my parents' entire lifetime. I hate Biden, but this is an indisputable fact. I know. So It's so strange, dude. Do you want the truth, or do you want... Do you want the truth, okay? Or do you want to just keep posturing? Machinist. Sorry. If you want the truth, then that is the truth. Biden is one of the most pro-labor presidents. Biden's administration and his federal agencies have been one of the most pro-labor administrations. That is the reality. Having said that, however, he is still a genocidaire. This is why I always tell you when, when I always, this is why I always tell you, I will unconditionally tell you the truth. I will not do, you know, propaganda in either direction that is devoid of the truth. The standard is very low, but Biden has absolutely cleared it. Okay. Very weird that people refuse to recognize that. Yes, Biden is also the first president, sitting president, to actually go and show up to a picket line. That is also true. And although that is symbolic, it's a very important, it is a very important move. You're not even saying it's great by like any European country standards, just that it's been the best for us in a long time. Yes, they're intentionally ignoring the word most to be annoying. I know. His strike busting is an unforgivable act to some. Yes, I understand that. Except you could ask the unions themselves how they feel about it. And the union themselves, the railroad unions, have come out and supported Biden after Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, commanded by Joseph Robinette Biden, went back to the freight companies and said, you have to give them sick days, and then they did. We're very happy about this. We've been trying to get this for decades, said Artie Maratia, president of the Transportation Communications Union. It was public pressure and political pressure that got them to come to the table. The reason why we're relitigating this over and over again is because a lot of people see the first side of a story and don't care about the follow-up, okay? Look, the dude is a terrible candidate, but he's gotten more shit done um, than anyone while anyone who's in here has been alive. If you don't agree, you're just ignoring your objection facts or not really a leftist. I hate this talking point from leftists. We literally all love our new time off agreements and paid sick time off. The last few agreements we've gotten since National in 2020, uh, in 22 have been the most phenomenal and life-changing agreements. Yeah, leftists who are in this chat, who are not rank-and-filers in the railroad union, which, by the way, rank-and-filers in the railroad union have actually criticized the union leadership for not, take, not making even more demands, like not aggressively standing and demanding more from the Biden administration. There are always going to be... This is a democracy. This is a democratic process. There are always going to be people who are not happy. Okay? But the reality is that the union itself communicated, and many of the rank and filers also took this as a W. When Joe Biden and Congress enacted legislation in December that blocked a threatened freight rail strike, many workers angrily faulted Biden for not ensuring that the legislation also guaranteed paid sick days. But since then, the union official says... Members of the Biden administration, including the Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, who stepped on on uh, March 11th, lobbied the railroads, telling them it was wrong not to grant paid sick days. We've made a lot of progress, said Greg Reagan, president of the Transportation Trades Department at the AFL-CIO, the main U.S. Uh, Labor Federation. This is being done the right way. Each railroad is negotiating with each of its own individual unions on this. The rail companies, he added, miscalculated how the public would see their huge profits and the stories about how hard railroad uh, workers' lives were and not having sick days in the draconian policies they were operating under. Why are we relitigating this? Because there are chatters in here who see me always say, fuck Joe Biden. And by the way, that position has not changed. Fuck Joe Biden is still 
my position and think that it's an opportunity to also spread certain narratives that are demonstrably false. People have a very black and white understanding of politics and refuse to see nuance in this conversation. The calculation for a Joe Brandon re-election, regardless of his fucking dementia, would be very different pre-October 6th, pre-October 7th, okay? <clears throat> Do you think the unmolested strike of the railroad workers would have had better or worse outcomes than what Buttigieg got? It absolutely would have had better outcomes. It absolutely would have had better outcomes. It would have been tumultuous. It would have been unimaginably chaotic. But yes, if uninterrupted, I personally believe that, yes, I think that the, the, um, the strikes, if left, uh, if the Biden administration didn't step in and force them, it literally, it definitely would have had better outcomes. And it's right to criticize the union busting, man. What the fuck? Yeah. If he didn't do anything afterwards, it wouldn't, ch then yes. Anyway, can we ban sports dweebs during the news hour? Absolutely not. Because they're literally spamming against the fucking silly ass derailers right now who are still trying to have arguments with me about shit that happened two years ago. It is absolute reality. When we were going making, I was, you know, I said I was going to be the most pro-union president in American or history. Or this guy. Well, guess what? I am, and I'm staying there. All right, and that's, uh, that's President Biden right there at the AFL-CIA headquarters uh, here in Washington as he tries to shore up support. Oh, my God. He said AFL. He said AFL-CIA, dude. Well, guess what? I am, and I'm staying there. All right, and that's, uh, that's President Biden right there at the AFL-CIA headquarters. Uh, here in Washington as he tries to shore up support uh, in certain corners of the Democratic Party. Of course, the breaking news we just heard a few moments ago, uh, actor and uh, Democratic uh, Party supporter George Clooney calling for President Biden to step out of the race. I want to bring in our uh, CNN senior it. data reporter, Harry Enton. I mean, Harry, one of the reasons why there is all of this consternation, we saw the former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, opening the door to President Biden, making the decision to get out of this race, even though he has said he wants to stay in. We're seeing a lot of... Uh, movement in these battleground polls and i'm wondering if you could walk us through that show us why there's some heartburn a lot of heartburn in the democratic party you right know, now you know jim yeah. we've been talking a lot about the national polls yeah. but of course the race is won or lost in the electoral college and i just really want to give an indication here yeah. that donald trump is favored at this particular point that's the bottom line you know if the election were held today according to the cook political report 268 electoral votes are either leaning or solid in his direction versus just 226 for Joe Biden. The only real toss-ups are up here in the Midwest, right? Wisconsin, Michigan, and down on the Great Lakes in Pennsylvania. And I will tell you, Jim, that I've been looking and talking with folks on the internal polls in these individual states yeah. up here in that Midwest region. These polls do not look good for Joe Biden at this particular point. Donald Trump is leading in these internal polls. And then, of course, Arizona, uh, down here in Nevada, Georgia, all states that Joe Biden won last time around, all of them leaning towards Donald Trump at this point. And hour. if he doesn't win those blue wall states, it's over. That's it. it, it yeah. if, he, if he wins, if he doesn't win he has to any run one all. of these, yeah. he has to run the table. Yeah. He has to win all of these states. And I know from the internal data that I've been talking to folks, he's not ahead in a single one of them right now. Let's discuss with CNN political commentator and former Obama White House senior advisor Ashley Allison and former Trump administration official Matt Mowers. Uh, Ashley, let me go to you first on this George Clooney news. Uh, we saw the president visiting the AFL-CIO a few moments ago. Obviously, he's trying to shore up support with certain parts of the Democratic Party base. But how big of a blow is that to have George Clooney say, you know what, Mr. President, you need to step aside? Look, it, it's not great to have someone um, who just... <laughs> I'm new at politics stuff. Is this good? Yeah. Is this? I can't tell. Dude, you want to know how fucking devastating it is? Here, you want to see some internal polling? New. Internal Democrat polling post-debate has Biden down double digits in swing districts, New York 17 and New York 19, and down a point in New York 22. All districts Biden carried in 2020 per party source. The three competitive upstate suburban districts are considered a part of the suburban New York bellwether districts. That's why the New York Democrats came out and said, holy shit, you have to drop out. Earlier today, the fucking New York Lieutenant Governor, Antonio Delgado, came out and released this statement. He said, President Biden deserves our eternal gratitude, blah, blah, blah. You already know, okay? 
I have immense respect and admiration for his deep and abiding commitment to the American people and our founding democratic ideals. He can add to his legacy, showing his strength and grace by ending his campaign and making room for a new leader. Israel's strongest soldier, most loyal soldier, Richie Torres, came out with a statement and said, hey, man, I don't know what's happening right now, but like maybe we should reconsider, as I showed you earlier. You do not understand. New. Four sources close to Biden's re-election effort tell NBC News the campaign is suffering a major downshift in donations and the officials are bracing for a seismic fundraising hit. The money has absolutely shut off. Two of the sources close to the re-election effort said this month is on a path for fundraising to be down by possibly half or much more, one of them said, from larger donors alone. Sources emphasize that donations were down across the board. Biden campaign spokesperson pushed back on the notion that fundraising was down. That's not accurate. On grassroots fundraising, the first seven days of July were the best start to the month on the campaign, and many of those were first-time donors. They're trying to say Biden is actually... They're trying, they're trying to say Biden is actually like a Bernie Sanders style candidate. And that, um, you know, the people are with him. The elites are not. Why? Because they are terrified of Biden being the strong socialist administrator, the so strong socialist competent administrator. That's what it is, I think. Okay. Biden is the fifth column. Biden is the truth. The general secretary, Biden. He's doing the damn thing. He's doing phenomenal work. Here's more internal polling. This is Wisconsin. On MSNBC, Nicole Wallace, one of Biden's world, uh, one of Biden world's favorite voices on the network, reads Wisconsin polling showing Biden dragging down congressional Democrats. This is the other side of the equation. Biden doesn't just end up imploding his campaign and allow Donald Trump to win. He also brings down the down ballot candidates. Because there's no world in which people just go, oh, I'm a split ticket voter. God, dude, you suck. Thanks, man. People are already going to be so angry that we're having this conversation. We may as well go there, Wallace said, before laying out Harris's political advantages, saying she gave an electric speech and was magnetic. She has chops that often don't get showcased. She does not. She does not have chops that often don't get showcased. She's just simply better than Biden because she is not demented. Wallace, who got a rare interview with Biden in 2023, whatever happens next, the polls tell a very clear story about where the voters are on Joe Biden. I wonder what you think is possible if Kamala Harris took that top spot. Now, I want to point out something else here because there's the likes of Will Stansel and some other fucking, you know, Biden, uh, you know, Biden holdouts here. The religious zeal that surrounds the anti-Biden obsessives is really frightening. Not even the slightest hint of doubt about the remarkably reckless course of action they're demanding. Being a few points behind in the polls after two weeks of saturation level media panic isn't great, but Trump was much further behind in 2016 and still won. I'm sorry. You are literally the stupidest person. You need to drop. You need to, you need to never tweet again about politics. This tweet in and of itself is in a sea of really, really, really bad takes, probably the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. Dog, Donald Trump in 2016 was much further behind. Donald Trump in 2016 was an outsider against Hillary Clinton. What the fuck? You think that's an adequate comparison? Are you on crack? Donald Trump in 2016 was not the president for four fucking years. Joe Biden in 2024 is perhaps the exact opposite of Donald Trump in 2016. A person who has spent his entire life in front of a podium as a lifelong politician with a shit ton of baggage. Donald Trump in 2016, no political baggage at a time when people are looking for a establishment candidate or an anti-establishment candidate. 2020 is obviously different. We saw what the anti-establishment candidate did. This comparison does not favor Biden. Uh, oh, the thing I wanted to show you was what Osita actually responded to Will with, by the way, which is, let me see if I can find it. Um, and this is great. I mean, he's absolutely right. He says, I mean, who is displaying a lack of humility here? The case against Biden is fundamentally based on polling data. Against that, we have assertions that the entire polling industry is probably wrong based on an election 56 years ago and gut feeling. 
The polls could be the polls could well be catastrophically wrong. Biden could be in a much better position than he seems and might win. But those are suppositions. I think we have fewer solid grounds to believe them than to believe he's currently losing this election. The case is that his polls are down, but everyone else's are down more. But we know that a dramatic ticket switch would bring up those candidates' numbers because waves hands. Harris isn't polling that differently. There was one poll circulating within the last day or so that showed her ahead of Trump. Case is that there's probably more upside there than with Biden apps in a plan to convince the 70% of public who think he's unfit that he isn't. None of this is driven by anti-Biden obsessives. Will can't get out of his own little script to see is that the moderates uh, are those who are freaking out. That is the truth. That is why. Like, it doesn't matter what I say about Joseph Robinette Biden. I'm just saying this is 2019. Nobody fucking listens to me. Are you kidding me? I can only sit around and say, I told you so. Right? I'm not Matty Iglesias. I'm not John Favreau. And I'm certainly not Nadler, Nancy Pelosi, um, Adam Smith, and many others. Michael Bennett. So many establishment Democrats who have said he has to be he has to be replaced. This conversation is not coming from the left. This conversation is coming from very important Democratic Party donors. And more importantly than even them, the motherfucking Democratic Party's top leadership. It is delusional to conduct a straw man argument. Damn, this guy's good.